the trick to completing any large, complicated project is to break it down into small, manageable pieces. And this is especially true of dealing with the mind. The mind is a very complex thing. Learning how to train it, learning how to bring it to release, free it from its habits of creating unnecessary suffering, requires that we keep things as simple as possible. The more abstract we get, the more we deal in abstractions, the further away we get from the actual nitty-gritty of the practice, the things that really will make a difference in the mind. It's one of the reasons why we start out with a breath. It is the most basic function of the body. And if you can't breathe properly, there's not much else you can think of doing properly either. So we back up and learn to deal with the breath. Keep it close to home. And when we try to develop discernment, it's we focus on pain. And again, that's something very close to home. Focus on stress. Reduce things to basic experiences that we can relate to immediately. Because the more you start dealing with abstractions or big metaphysical theories, the further and further you get away from what you're actually experiencing, and the more, there's, the more room there is for doubt, and the more room there is for self-delusion. Defilements find an easy time of hiding behind abstractions. I find people coming up here sometimes talking about their lives, and the more abstract they get about describing what their problem is, the more you realize they're hiding something. Not necessarily from me, but from themselves. And so if you want to cut away self-delusion, try to keep things as direct and as simple as possible. How is your breath going? How is your mind dealing with unpleasant things as they arise? If you keep your mind on these two things, you can cut through an awful lot of room for self-delusion. This is why the Buddha's teachings emphasize so much the issue of stress and suffering, because it's something that's right there. And all the issues of the mind kind of gather around that. The image we've used many times before, it's like the watering hole. All the animals in the savanna have to come to the watering hole. And so your thoughts about who you are and how the world is treating you, how you relate to the body, how you relate to other people, all hover around this issue of stress and pain. And when you can reduce things to stress and pain, it's very helpful for cutting through a lot of the complications. Because sometimes we hold on to our pain. We actually think it ennobles us. We're proud of our, our suffering in one way or another. I've noticed some people resent the idea that tress, uh, translating the word dukkha as stress doesn't give it enough dignity. Well, that's the whole point of it. Cut through your stress and pain and all your existential anguish and everything. Well, it's just that. It's just stress that you create for yourself. When you look at it from that angle, it loses a lot of its appeal, which is the whole point of the teaching. And even the states of pleasure that you can create for yourself, you begin to realize, well, there's stress behind it. It's like going to a see a comedy in a theater. If you sit out in the audience and just let yourself get carried away by the comedy, you have no idea of how much effort goes into it, how much sweat goes into it, how much stress and strain there is on the people who are pr producing the comedy. If you go back behind stage, you begin to get some idea of this. And after a while, it becomes not so funny, after all. And it's the same with all the elaborate things that we create in our mind. They entertain us, they impress us, whatever. But if you just look at the process of mental creation, you begin to realize how, how stressful it is, how much make-believe goes into it. And how it doesn't really provide the satisfaction that you would normally hope from it. 
And again, the whole purpose of this is dispassion, disenchantment. Because it's only through being disenchanted with these things that you start looking for something better, that you're willing to let them go. So it's this simple, insistent question all the way along the line. When you're dealing with concentration, is your mind really still? Is it really solid? Is it really centered? And when you start looking at the rest of your life from the point of view of that concentrated mind, you look for the stress, look for the impermanence, look for the extent to which these things are not under your control. Ultimately, you'll turn those same tools around to analyze the concentrated mind. But don't be in too great a hurry for that. Hold on to that state of concentration. Hold on to that your object, whether it's the breath or whether you start focusing on more formless aspects, like the sense of space or the sense of consciousness, depending on where you are in your concentration practice. You want to maintain that, keep that going. Because that's your tool, it's your fulcrum point for prying loose a lot of other attachments. You look at the pleasure that you used to get from outside things, you begin to realize, well, there's not much real pleasure, there's not much real essence to that at all. Think of all the pleasures you felt in the past, all the sensual pleasures. Where are they now? They're gone. The Buddha compares them to dew on the grass. They're there for just a moment, and then they've gone away. And what they leave, though, is a hunger. And we try to, as we say, we take the, take the bad with the good, which means that we try to cover up the bad as much as possible from ourselves. But the Buddha says, don't cover it up. Look at it for what it is. Because denial is a form of stress as well. And it prevents us from knowing anything better. So once the mind is still and you, you feel it's time to look at the rest of your life from that perspective, look for that issue of inconstancy and stress. To give you the proper perspective on things, proper in the sense that leading the mind to release. Always keep this in mind, that the, the Buddha is teaching us skills to bring the mind to true freedom. He's not the sort of person who wanted to just go out and badmouth the world, say, well, this isn't good enough and that's not good enough, without giving us something better. He says, look, there's something better than this. These are the pleasures you've been contending with yourself with for many, many lifetimes, but they don't give any real contentment. And in the course of trying to find them, you end up doing and saying things that you're later going to regret, that you can't, sometimes as you can't be proud of. All the stupid and selfish and cruel things we do in the world are because of our hunger for pleasures we've had in the past, we want to have them all over again. And so it's learning to focus on the stressful side of these things that their drawbacks. That's what enables us to say, there must be something better than this, and be willing to let them go and look for that something better. It's basically what our practice is about, developing the skill to find what's better in the mind. I mentioned this afternoon in the old days, back in ancient civilizations, they talked about two kinds of knowledge. There's scribe knowledge and there's warrior knowledge. Not warrior in the sense of macho, but it's in the sense of someone who has developed skills to use in difficult situations. And that's the kind of knowledge we're working on here. Scribe knowledge just tells, well, this is this and that's that, and it can describe things. And tends to get involved in an awful lot of abstractions, which just pull us away from where we want to be. Warrior knowledge has a purpose in attaining a particular goal by developing skills. That's what we're working on here. 
and the skills are basic. They tell stories in the canon of seven-year-old boys and girls becoming arahants. So it's not a question of mastering a lot of complicated thought processes, but it's actually a process of learning to strip things down to real basics and not let yourself stray far away from them. Because when things are kept simple, there's very little room for self-delusion. When they're kept in the area of immediate experience, there's very little room for doubt. The breath comes in, you know it's coming in. Breath goes out, you know it's going out. There's pain, you know there's pain. There's no pain, you know there's no pain. When you keep it on this level, there's very little le opening for confusion, deception, all the other abstractions that keep us keep us confused about where we want to go and what we want to do, what's really worthwhile in life. So if you find yourself wandering away from the breath, ask yourself, where are you going? What are you looking for? All you need, everything you need, is right here. Remember the Buddha gained awakening right here at the breath. When you're with the breath, concentrate it on the breath. All the types of fabrication the Buddha talked about, which he said the whole purpose of discernment is to see into the process of fabrication, and there are three kinds. There's bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, and mental fabrication. We go down the list. Bodily fabrication is the breath. Well, that's right here. Verbal fabrication is directed thought and evaluation, because those are the two mental qualities you need in order to speak. The basic structure of sentences, directed thought, that points to the subject of the sentence. Evaluation describes the subject talks about it. Well, those are right here. You're directing your thought to the breath and you're evaluating the breath. Then there's mental fabrications, feeling and perception. Well, those are right at the breath as well. There's a feeling of pleasure or pain or neutral feelings that come with the breath. And then perception, those are the labels that you put on things when you see, okay, that feels good, that doesn't feel good. All these things are right here. And the closer you can stay to being right here, the more clearly you see them. And you realize that these are the basic building blocks of everything else that you experience. And when you comprehend the basic building blocks, then the other things are easier to understand as well. When you take these things apart, that takes everything else apart as well. Always be careful not to wander away from what's simple and direct. What's immediately right here. It's because we overlook what's immediately right here and look other places. That's why we're so confused. But if we can see how all those outside things reconnect right back here, then it's a lot easier to unravel them. This is why there's so much emphasis on coming into the present moment. It's not the purpose of the practice to get to the present moment. The present moment is part of the path. Coming to the present moment so that you can see things and start unraveling all your confusion, unraveling all your attachments and clingings, by reducing them to things that you can see and look at directly and realize, well, this isn't anything worth hanging on to. And the Buddha says when you can start unraveling things like that, then things that are better begin to open up. <laughs>